RPG Pundit, and final boss in Internet Shitlords. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Thank you. I'm I'm good. Good. This is going to be a unique episode because we, you know, we don't usually talk about your sort of, you know, your topic of expertise. But I know you, you know, you've got a lot of other interests too, and we can uh, we've got lots to talk about. But I really think that what you talk about and what you're sort of tracking right now is kind of at the leading edge of the culture war in a way. I mean, I really do think like I've been thinking about, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like, we should have him on the show. And then I was like, man, I was kind of, you know, playing D and D. I was in the D and D community. And I thought, would that be a good fit or like? What would you know? I wasn't you. You were new to me, right? And I've, as I've been following you over the over the years and sort of watching what's going on with everything in the culture, I'm like, we got to talk about this now. Like, stuff is getting so crazy in my mind. It's getting it's getting crazy, and I love the way you're breaking it all down. So, I think oh, it'll be well, good. For, it'll be good for our audience. Well, <laughs> happy to serve. <laughs> so, what um, have you always been? sort of following this kind of stuff what about your interest in history like tell us a little bit about yourself uh you know the, your interest in in the, the occult the invisible college history a bit before we kind of get into some of the the woke stuff right um so i i've been a gamer since i was a kid right but you know tabletop role-playing games is what we're talking about here not when we're, whenever I mention RPGs, I'm not talking about video games. I'm talking about games like Dungeons and Dragons that you play on a tabletop, just in case if any of your audience might get confused by that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and I was a you know a, an avid fan of the game since I was 11 years old. Are you are and, you Gen X? Are you Gen X or young like, yeah, early, Gen early Gen X? Early Gen X? Okay. Um, I'm actually oh, no, middle Gen, Gen X. X. Okay. <laughs> okay. Middle, okay. Slightly on the later end of the Gen X spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I meant. Yeah, I was born in seventy, so. Yeah, well, so I, I was, um, I wasn't ever expecting to to be a, an RPG designer. Although I mean, you know, it was a childhood dream, right? Um, or to you know become well known for any of, of anything to do with the RPG world. I, I studied history and comparative religions in university, and. Um, then later I started working in um, a number of different subjects. And at the same time, I was, I was investigating in an experimental way, all of the kind of the history of mysticism that I, that, that I had studied academically. Um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with, with Alan Watts, um, the, the, the Buddhist writer, well, the writer on Buddhism who was, also, you know, he, he also did comparative studies, right? And he said that the the problem with um, religious studies in academia is that um, you have half of the the academy thinks that you have to remain objective and maintain your perspective. You can't involve yourself in what you're doing, and the other half believe you should involve yourself in what you're doing, right? And that second half that are involving themselves in what they're doing are disqualified because they're no longer able to to um, maintain a, a, an objective perspective. But the first half are disqualified because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and uh, I, I was very much on the side of Watts with that, that, you know, if, if I don't do it, I don't know what the hell it's about, right? So I ended up um, doing a lot of stuff, world traveling and... Uh, getting uh very involved in the study of mysticism esoteric traditions on the occult um and i've you know i've done some some work in those areas achieved certain degrees in certain things um not academic degrees i mean but certain yeah, levels yeah. of authority in certain traditions and have been a teacher in that for for some time too um always on a very small scale though and by the early 2000s, I'd moved to South America and I was um, engaged in a, you know, I was working online. I was engaged in a job that was, that was not super strenuous. And, and I discovered uh, internet forums about d and And I was, like I said, an avid gamer. And I, I also, at that time, at the beginning of the 2000s, there was already some people getting into um, role, tabletop role-playing games who were kind of like, you know, obviously, we can't say that they were the woke because there was nobody woke. That that wasn't a term that even existed in the in the early two thousands. 
but um, that were these kind of snooty, pretentious people who are mostly liberals and who had some very highfalutin ideas of what role-playing games should be. And about like, especially there were some guys that were these kind of pseudo academics. A lot of them did have real degrees, but they didn't have anything to do with what they were doing here. Um, that were trying to say that there was like some kind of theory for designing the perfect RPG. And I, I decided to, you know, start a blog to, argue against them. It's also the very beginnings of like internet censorship at that time. We're talking about 2005, 2006, um, where the major RPG forum at that time, discussion forum, you know, this is before social media for the kids, right? Before there was Instagram, there used to be these message boards. <laughs> they still exist, but you know, they, none of the kids know this, right? And so people would go on those message boards and make long discussions about things they liked. Um, and the chief RPG message board at that time was hijacked basically by this group of people that had an ideological agenda that was very kind of left wing and that and they were they started banning anyone who disagreed with them and this was you know years before the real like censorship about 10 years before gamergate for example right so it was way before the, the kind of online censorship became a major thing they, these people were ahead of their time and so i started a blog i started critically and you could say viciously attacking these people for their idea their, their wrong ideas about you know game design all of which are kind of predicated on the idea that the game that people actually like is a bad game you know the, these people don't know enough they don't understand like one of them literally said right that that most gamers don't realize that they're not actually having fun playing dungeons and dragons right because dungeons and dragons is such an incoherent inferior game that they couldn't possibly have fun but we know better and we're going to show them how to play these games that we like that are just they were just, just these worthless games right so i made this blog i started um fighting back in a way that nobody else had done at the time and, and you know in a very rude kind of aggressive boisterous sort of way um that caused a whole bunch of people to get angry at me right but then there were a bunch of people sorry no i'm just laughing oh uh, yeah, yeah a bunch of people got angry at me right but um including some people that weren't you know part of that group but that thought well you know you're being pretty rude guy right and stuff like that but at the same time i started to get a lot of fans you know i became kind of the shock jock of of rpgs and uh then i started to get people in the industry people that were working for the major gaming companies that started following me, you know, and started, but and, and started writing to me in secret, telling me, you know what, you're right about this guy or that guy, you know, he's exactly what you think he is, you know, uh, which was very funny. And uh, on a, on the account that this um, RPG message forum had been, it's called RPG Net. It still exists. It's just become this horrible, like it's the most woke place in the world, right? But um, it had been and that it had been subverted. I decided that I was going to take over another RPG forum that had that that a couple of people had tried to set up as an alternative and then it like petered out. And I took it, uh, they said, oh yeah, yeah, if you think you can do better than us, go right ahead, right? <laughs> you're you're gonna fail too, right? And then within six months, it became the, the 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 second or third biggest RPG forum around. And it's still around too. It's called the RPG site. Um, eventually some of the people that followed my blog ended up getting positions in some of the biggest companies. And uh, one guy that followed my blog when he was relatively unknown, he was just a would-be game designer at that time, was a guy named Mike Merles. And Mike Merles later on became the head of Dungeons and Dragons for Wizards of the Coast, the subsidiary of Hasbro that, that owns D&D. And once he did, at that time, there was a, a very bad edition of Dungeons and Dragons that was going around. It was fourth edition. It was it was it had been based in part on the theories of these pseudo intellectuals that had said, well, you know, D and D is too incoherent a game, and you have to turn it into something else that's more streamlined, and 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 nobody liked that. I I predicted on my blog when that edition came out that two thirds of the customer base were going to leave Dungeons and Dragons because of it. And when fourth edition finally gave up the ghost, it was like the shortest edition ever. Right? Didn't they, they tried for a few years and they realized they were just hemorrhaging money. So they said, well, okay, we're going to switch. We're going to do a fifth edition. It's going to be the opposite of fourth. And, and they put Mike Merles in charge of it. And Mike Merles came to me and he said, you know what? That prediction you made, it was exactly right. <laughs> and then I was hired to consult on the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, which is still right now the current edition and is the most popular edition that Hasbro ever made. So, I, I kind of helped with that. But as a result of this, when I got put, when it, when it was announced that I was on Dungeons and Dragons, um, 
there was and not just me, but another couple of people too that were that were in the consultant capacity for Mike Merles, and that was that were people that were hated by the internet left. We're talking now. This was 2013, right? In 2014, when the game came out, they um, these the, the the leftists at that time started a movement in the role playing hobby that was called Consultant Gate which was a movement, first an attempt to boycott the new edition and then to demand that that the consultants be fired, which makes no sense because we were done working for them at that point. It was not a, we weren't full-time hires. We were people that worked to design the game, right? And then that, you know, Mike Merles have to like apologize. So that, all, all these typical things, but it's like, a, it was a cancellation act, right? But it was actually the, the first one that that I had really personally experienced because it ha this happened about six months before Gamergate happened. I was just going to ask that. I was just going to ask was their, that. It was their test run for what they later did again in a much bigger scale at Gamergate. They did it first in the RPG hobby, and I was one of the people they targeted. Um, but, you know, they ended up failing completely, obviously, because 5th edition was, was, was a huge success. So instead, they took it over. They gradually started having people with their ideology get into positions of, of work or authority in Wizards of the Coast, often by saying something like, well, you know what? This D and D game is horribly racist and you're racist if we don't, if you don't change it. And, and then, you know, the people, the, the, the people at Hasbro, the suits would panic and they say, Oh no, no, we want to be racist. We want to be not racist. We want to be inclusive. We want to be diverse. And they go, okay, well then hire me. And then they'd hire the person who was crapping all over the, them in, in the public sphere, right? And then that person would be in and they'd hire all their friends. And pretty soon, Mike Merles was gone and the whole company is now under the control of the, the woke movement. So after I did fifth, helped make fifth edition, I started publishing some games of my own. And they're part of another movement that has come up in opposition to what, what's been happening with D&D, which is called the OSR, which is the which means the old school renaissance. And these are games that are based on the original D and D rules, the the D and D rules of the nineteen seventies and eighties, and so the, so because the box, of this, the, the, sorry, the, box set, the box set that I would have played with in eighty four, eighty five, then absolutely the Menser box set, the big red box set, yeah, with the, with the guy fighting the dragon, right? Yeah. It was those rules, and because you can't copyright rules, you know, there's no copyright on on the mechanics of rules of a game, you can't legally own that. The OSR took those rules and started producing new games and new adventures in that older style, but some of them with a very modern take too, right? Like, and, and the the idea was that those rules were um, over the course of time in the OSR, the game, the the movement has evolved into a design movement where people are making now new games that are sometimes very interesting new subjects. Um, using the rules that are still Dungeons and Dragons rules, so everybody knows how to play them. You know, it's, anybody who played D and D will know how to play any OSR game. And the OSR has become the biggest, most popular indie um, design movement in the history of role playing games. It's, it's there's thousands of OSR games, and it's had the the largest success as a coherent movement. Um, and I've published a large number of games, and then I've also my blog, you know, which used to be on Zanga, so this gives you an idea how old it was, right? It it kind of was petered out as people stopped reading blogs, but I started a YouTube channel, and now my my YouTube channel, which I hope that you might link to it in your in your description later or something after the live stream, um, it's got a very large following, and um, there's a, a large number of OSR YouTubers out there as well, most of whom are also designers, though lately there's been a few youngsters that are coming in, which I guess is a sign of the popularity of the OSR, that are just like, they're not actually designers, they're just people who talk about the OSR and have a, a channel and are, want to be like influencers or something. But, um, you know, the, this has become, um, the OSR has become a big point of resistance against the woke wokeification of RPGs. Role-playing games have one advantage, is that it's a decentralized process. If you've got a video game, right, and that video game is taken over by a woke company, an MMORPG, they own the place where you can play the video game, and you can't do anything about it, right? If your favorite comic book or TV show gets wokeified, you can't change it, right? There's nothing you can do about it. But with role-playing games, because they're played 
in groups, small groups of people. And because anyone can design the, a role playing game, it's very inexpensive. I mean, you, you can't say, well, uh, you know, if they say like, whatever Diablo, the new, the new version of Diablo is super woke. We're going to make an alternative. Well, good luck doing that unless you have millions of dollars. Right. Um, but if, if the, the new version of D and D is woke, you, all you need to do is publish a book, you know, like it's not that, it's not that hard. It's not that expensive. Right. Um, and so this decentralization makes it very hard for them to completely capture the hobby. Like they've captured other people's hobbies, you know, like they've done with video games, with comic books, with science fiction and fantasy and all of that. Right. Um, Marvel movies, whatever. Right. All of those have been captured. D and D the game is captured, but the entire hobby cannot be. And, and so the OSR has been a constant kind of thorn in the side of the woke for the last almost 10 years now. Um, and I've been one of several people that have been very kind of vocal and active in opposing them. I was a kind of, I was pretty much the first one. And I remember a time when, when, they were trying to push something in the hobby. And I was the single voice that dared to say no to them in public, right? I'd get people in private sending me messages saying, oh yeah, I totally agree with you, but I can't say anything so I'll get in trouble, right? Um, but you know, after about 2017 or so, pe other people started showing up, you know, after 2016, 17, a few, a few people showed up and every year there's more. And now there's like tons of people that are in the hobby that, that have realized that they can just tell these people to fuck off, you know? So yeah. I guess that's the story. I don't know if I've missed anything. You let me know. No, I mean, geez, you're answering questions I had along the way. So that, that was kind of a great background. I mean, I really, you know, Darren's not involved in the RPGs, but I wanted to kind of give Darren an example. Like if he was to ask like, okay, what's the big deal about this, you know, this, this thing being wokeified. And it's, it's almost like if Darren's Dune, Darren's a Dune fan, he likes all the books of Dune. It's almost like, and I'm going to ask you for some, for some good examples. Dune did go woke. How it's, did it? Well, no. Well, yeah. But the, but now the, the, the digital, <laughs> digital books are being changed, right? Like I've got a quote here from from Wizards of the Coast that says like every opportunity, every reprint is an opportunity to conduct a new inclusion review on previously published content. So with the digital versions now, they can just change shit in there and not even really come up with a new print right. print, well, print revision. So that's literally happened just now. These last couple of months. Um, Wizards of the Coast, you know, because if you buy the book, obviously, you know, if I, the 2014 Player's Handbook, you've got that book, um, <laughs> they can't change it. They can issue a new edition where they make changes uh, in the next edition or in the next printing. But with a digital book, if it's saved online, and this is the thing, there's now a lot of people that play online and they use different platforms, one of which is called D&D Beyond, which didn't used to be owned by Wizards, but now it is. and um their people have stored digital copies of the rule books and these are the, the rule books that are then used to adjudicate mechanics in the like automatic systems of the of, of the, the the online play um though they haven't really changed any of the mechanics yet but but what they have changed is a lot of the the surrounding text and and it just came out that they've been stealth been editing every part of the book removing sections that somebody because they they not, a few months ago they they had a bit of a scandal over um a certain type of monster that people claimed well not a monster a demi-human right like a, a non-human race that people thought was a racist stereotype of black people right because there are there are certain people in the world that if they see like an ape man they think that's a black person and those people are liberals because they're always the ones that jump and say oh that's a black person it's just just crazy right like how can how can you think that right but they think it and so um the, this this scandal led wizards to announce that from there on in every new product was going to have every single sentence reviewed by not one but three diversity consultants so that any problematic thing would be taken out of it before anything bad happened, right? And now apparently they've got these people looking at the old books, the 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 you know the old printings, and editing it out and replacing words or removing words. And and in some cases it's just trying to find like a synonym, which leads you to say, well, what's the point? But in other cases they remove a a, a descriptor that changes the whole meaning. Like I pointed out in one of my in my my recent live stream. There's a monster in D&D &D that is like this space alien spider. It's called a Niyogi. And 
the Neogi's whole deal was that they were these super alien um, sl interplanetary slave traders. But now the woke have decided you can't even talk about slavery in D&D. It's too dangerous. It's prob too problematic. Oh, that's got a ma I've got a major problem with this, this exact thing, but keep going. Yeah. So the, the Neogi, their whole deal is, you know, they're very evil. They're bad guys in the game, right? Um, because they are these, they, they go around, uh, they have like psychic powers so they can temporarily dominate someone and then they, they sell them into slavery, right? Um, and when you remove all of that part of it, the Neogi is just this like weird spider thing that are supposed to be bad. And the text still says they're bad, but it doesn't tell you why they're bad. It doesn't say what they do that's bad, you know? So they, they literally... It literally changes the the and, and obviously dilutes the value of the game, you know. So they're they're engaging in that kind of editing. They're changing. They've already announced that they're going to do a not a new edition of but a, a 0.5 edition type of thing, a new a new update to the rules next year. And there's bound to be a lot of very significant kind of. Um, alterations there that will be for ideological purposes rather than game playability. So Darren, this would be like, you know, they go into the Dune, they, they reprint all these Dune books, but they've changed all this stuff without sort of telling it everybody. Right. I mean, they, and it's not like they're always doing it stealthily. I mean, they're definitely making changes and they're talking about it and they're telling people that I don't agree with really barely any of the changes at all, but I mean, it would be like they changed the antagonists race or their, their name or the, 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 the magic in the world. I mean, all kinds of like crazy stuff would change because they find it's, in, you know, subjectively. Or made it so that a, a woman could be the at kinds, you know, something crazy like that. <laughs> Is that what they yeah, did well, in, in the movie? In a lot of, in a lot of science fiction movies nowadays, you have, uh, well, look at, I don't know if you're a fan of science fiction in general, but if you, you if you I don't know if you read the foundation series by Isaac Asimov, They've done a TV show of that now, right? Where half of the protagonists, who are almost all, you know, men and presumably white men, though maybe not all of them were were, were detailed by, you know, appearance in Asimov's books, because he tended to kind of gloss over that a bit. Um, but were definitely men, have all been replaced in the in the TV show with women of color. You know, it's the the panderverse thing. Yeah. And they do this in Dungeons and Dragons too. Like the the current group of people, they took a couple of different classic settings. I don't know how much you played in the 80s, but you might remember Ravenloft or Dragonlance. We we played Mysteria in in the 80s for in like a, I played just for a couple of years in 84 85ish and then I left the whole thing until like 2018 and I started playing 5th 3.5 and 5th edition in 2018 for about 5 years. Okay. Well, anyway, so you're familiar with these these concepts. Dragonlance was also a very famous series of novels, but it started out as a an RPG product. Um, and they've just last year, they, well, uh, um, in 2023 for Ravenloft, no, uh, 2023 for Dragonlance, 2022 for, for Ravenloft, they did uh, an updated version for fifth edition. And in both of these, they've drastically and dramatically changed the game, right? Like changed the setting of the game. Um, they've altered characters. I mean, Ravenloft is all about like, it's the horror setting, right? It's like, the based on vampires and all that stuff and and that the it's a place it's a it's a dark world it's a world where there's like very clearly good and evil right but evil kind of dominates the world and you're meant to be the one that fights it but they've had a big problem with this lately because the woke people want to say that there is no such thing as as evil people right and evil races you know and that's the thing there could be there could be evil actions like being you know um being intolerant but uh, but you can't say that a whole group of anything is evil, right? So they're even saying that things like the undead, like vampires or mind flayers or beholders or dark elves, that that those can't you can't call them evil anymore. So in, they've already said in the next edition they're getting rid of the alignment rules, which are you know the rules that determine what your character's personal philosophy is. Does he be, does he does he believe in law or chaos? Does he believe in good or evil? You know, they're taking that out. And so in, in this dark, supposed dark world, where in the classic version of that world, your character could be tempted by these dark uh, spiritual forces of the world. And if he accepted that temptation, he could gain special powers, but it would gradually corrupt his soul and turn him into a monster. You know, in the new version, you just get these special powers. 
you just, it doesn't matter, right? You know, nothing happens to you because there's nothing evil about it, you know? And then they've changed major characters, right? They've, they've gender flipped several of the characters, including like their version of Dr. Frankenstein is now a woman, right? And the Frankenstein monster is also a woman. And I think both of them are lesbians or something like that. You know? <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, in Dragonlance, they've done the same thing, you know? And it, that's really funny because Dragonlance, if, if, if there are people watching that are fans of the novels, they know this. It's one of these fantasy settings that it was like a very 80s fantasy setting where you had these ragtag outcast heroes and they were outcast because the world itself wasn't exactly fair to them. You know, it's like the main character of Dragonlance is Tannis Half-Elven, who he wanted to become a knight of this order of knights called the Salamnic Knights, but they wouldn't let him because he wasn't pure Salamnian. Salamnia is a country and because he's a half-elf, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let anyone in who was, was not pure Salamnian. And they also wouldn't let women into this knightly order. And over the course of the story, he, this character and, and his friends, who are all also kind of rejects, end up saving the world. They stop the Dark Queen, they kill the evil dragons, and uh, eventually they, you know, but w with great cost, you know, a very Tolkien-esque sort of fashion. And uh, by the end of it, the, the people, all the groups that were kind of like broken at the time, you know, the, the, the church was broken at the time, the knights were broken at the time, they were, they were all kind of like... Uh, they had become too hidebound and 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 um, and stuck in their in their ways. It's very very hippie kind of story, right? But at the end of it, um, they reform, right? So like the Salamnic Knights eventually allow you know after a woman saves them, they allow women and they allow non Salamnians to join their order, and they, they realize that the more important thing is like your merit, right? Like if you if you believe in chivalry, that's all that should matter, right? And stuff like that. In the new version, they they just say no no you can't do that. No, right from the start, the, the 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 cover character has to be a black female Salamnic knight. You know, <laughs> even though we're setting it at the beginning of the the of the story when that would have been impossible, and we're just going to say that there there have always been black female Salamnic knights, right, and whatever else. You know, because because to say that 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 anything else would risk someone being intolerant. You know, so the, this is this is the kind of stuff that they do that essentially ruins something that you love in the same way that that we've seen happen in movies and comic books and everything else it seems it seems like it's a a purposeful deletion of the hero's journey like when i when i started playing dnd of course it's like the the typical fantasy thing where you want to be the good guy that saves the world from this evil right i mean there's all kinds of evil monsters it's the it's kind of like the frodo or the luke skywalker the traditional hero's journey which has a mythical attraction to it like there's a reason why people love those stories it's also fundamental to not just our civilization, but every successful civilization to have that. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like they're purposely, I mean, I'd like to get your opinion on how sort of how big picture this is, but it feels like they're just getting rid of that. You know, you can't have these Absolutely. anymore. Absolutely. A hundred percent purposeful because um, you know, the, 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 these people are all collectivists. They're also anti-Western fundamentally, but also they're just kind of anti-civilization in general. They they believe that individual the, that the power of the individual is a dangerous thing, right? They they think that this is an evil and it has to be taught as an evil, whereas we've always taught it in our society as a good, you know. And most societies do to some extent, some less than us, but still. Um, and so. This concept of a of a single hero or a group of heroes going out into the world fighting evil, objective evil, and and vanquishing it, and then coming back stronger, and and then and then you know returning to to, to you know uh, to reward for the what they have achieved. Um, this is this is the absolute opposite of what they want to suggest, right? They want this like the, the world where there is no evil to fight, where there is nothing that good that any individual can accomplish, or any good has to be done as a collective, not as an individual. Um, and, and where the idea of um, succeeding through effort or discipline or merit has to be seen as, as evil itself, because it suggests that people that don't have discipline or don't want to make the effort or lack the merit should not succeed, you know? And, and, and so because of that, it's it's the Foucaultian view that all hierarchy is fundamentally oppression. And so all hierarchies have to be destroyed. And that's what they're doing. They're doing it literally with RPGs, right? In, in the traditional RPG, 
adventures had to do with you going out into the dungeon or into the wilderness on a quest usually trying to to hunt down some some treasure or to defeat some monster and so there was you know dungeon adventuring um sometimes there was more complex plots right war or intrigue or you know a, a crime mystery to solve or something like that um but the more recent new products that have been put out by wizards have decided to completely alter this into a the a, a, a their their concept of the correct way to play D&D is basically as this kind of um the only way I could describe it is as is like a a girly um a girly soap opera or something like that you know so like their most recent i'm not kidding you right their most recent publications of of adventures and settings that have not been an attempt to rehash and mangle old settings have been um a a book that is that is dedicated to uh, adventures written by people of color, no, it, it bragged that there wasn't a single white person involved, where each adventure highlights a different culture of the world, but not really in the adventuring sense. Like the, the, the main, the first main adventure in the entire game is that you go to a night market and have a food eating contest, right? So it's basically cool. Eat, Pray, Love, right? The movie Eat, Pray, Love, but in a fantasy version, right? So and if the one is not in lunch, they just like chased him off. It's like, get out of here, Whitey. <laughs> no, there's not even. I mean, there are there are some encounters there. There are a couple of things with monsters, but like that, they make it really clear that the emphasis is about discovery and and kind of the exploration of these of these various non-white worlds that they've created. You know, um, and well, and then yeah, the one that, we, one, a whimsical we, adventure. Sorry, were, were you Darren? Were you talking about the the um, the team of writers for that book? Where they had all black. Yeah, yeah. Right this was, this said no one. Yeah, yeah. He was talking about the the crew that they got to write the adventures. Yeah. What about yeah, well, them? They, well, just how that how that goes about. Like, how do you do you you, you just say why? Right. Well, okay. Yeah, there's a the story to that. Um, so there was a, another earlier book in 2022 called Candlekeep Mysteries, which was a set of adventures that were each written by a different person. So they started to do this, the compilation book, and part of this is a make work program for mediocre, useless, woke writers, you know, because um, the, 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 none of these people are capable of actually doing game design, but they can make up little stories, right? And, but they're not very big ones. So they need like 23 of them to do a book, right? And that, these books have enormous credit sections now because each person wrote three or four pages. And the Candlekeep Mysteries was already trying to, to push its woke notes, right? right. It, it started by saying, that it was the first book ever to have a dungeon that was wheelchair accessible. I'm, I'm not fucking kidding you here, right? Wheelchair accessible dungeon. And then it, it bragged about how several of the writers were presenting settings that were of, um, that, that were based on non-European worlds, right? Um, one of the guys that was hired there uh, was actually a guy who had earlier on claimed that the old oriental adventure books from the 80s um, in Dungeons and Dragons was horribly racist. It was, you know, cultural appropriation, colonialist, imperialist, and all of this. His name was Daniel Kwan. He's a Canadian. Um, and he was he he had, was calling for a total boycott of Wizards. Wizards panicked, of course, and so they did what they always do. They gave him a job. Um, oh they God. made him one of the writers in this book where he did a, his version of a Chinese adventure. And his criticism of Oriental adventures was that it was all just based on like kung fu movies and 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 comic books, right? And his adventure was entirely based on kung fu movies and comic books because he's not really Chinese. He's a second or third generation Canadian. He, I don't know if he even speaks Chinese. He had no no further knowledge of his own culture than than Gary Gygax did, you know. But he, for him, it was okay. Everybody praised it as a wonderful adventure because he had the right magical blood, right? He had the right genetics to make the game. Whereas, you know, the problem really was just that a, a white guy had made Oriental adventures, and there he was, right? Another one of these guys was a guy named Ajit George, who was hired. I think he must have been like a buddy of somebody on the staff of Wizards because his his day job is that he has this um, charity foundation for India, right? He's, he's an East Indian, right? Um, as an East Indian, right? And 
but he's also clearly a gamer and and his adventure wasn't especially bad or anything um and they realized that unlike daniel kwan Ajit george had a tiny bit of talent so they they asked him would you like to write a whole you know direct one of these books he said yes but only if everybody involved is a person of color and they said oh my god that's a great idea right and so they did this and they actively advertised it um as as bragging that there's not a single white person involved you know but the, the ironic thing is that there's also very few people who know anything about any of the cultures that they created like they they they're almost all second or third generation immigrants right like there's a venezuelan woman uh that wrote one of the adventures in in this this eat pray love book that basically her whole deal was oh you know it's venezuelan because there are arepas in it you know the food that venezuelans eat you know because she's like a third generation american and has no real ties to venezuela again and you know this because she's a communist you know any venezuelan who isn't in venezuela is an anti-communist you know? <laughs> unless they're they're like multi-generational descendants that went to some you know they went to goddamn columbia or something you know columbia university i mean or or, or harvard or something um and so and, and most of these people that they're hiring now are just like they're literal it's literal nepotism they're they're hiring people who have no experience in writing rpgs in designing rpgs many of these people admitted that they hadn't played rpgs before they were hired any they hadn't played dnd at all right a lot of them were from a, a cluster of people that were all hired together because they were all friends whose main job is vegan cookbook writing and then suddenly they get hired to write a DD book you know? <laughs> so this is this is the sort of stuff that you're dealing with here you know so just to give everybody an ex you know sort of an example of how sort of bad this is getting or, or what the what i see i mean they went through the whole like monsters you mentioned some of that where you know they're just getting rid of like this evil idea of even even monsters that are inherently evil like we all know like undead like zombies all these people that aren't even living like you know there's supposed to be evil monsters out there they're getting yeah. rid of sort of that whole idea of that and then what the funny thing is sort of it's 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 become almost cool to become a monster character in a way like so it's, yeah. it's blending the whole the whole thing between you know no longer just like humans or humanoids fighting evil monsters now you know you, if orcs can't be evil then why can't you play an orc or what whatever other kind of monster so then they they're having problems with the with the dwarves and the dark elves and that with half breeds they don't want to do that then they're then they're changing um words like like tribal civilization um yeah. madness uh fat you're not allowed to say tribal anymore you have to say typal yeah like so and and it just seems like i've got examples here i don't think we need to go through them but i mean stuff that just you're, you're just taking all the flavor out of it it seems like and and i what i'm shocked at is the amount of people that are okay with this that kind of like these changes all well, language they're, they're, changes they're, language changes we got to keep up with the times i'm like you're, you're just you're kind of just destroying you're destroying history in a way here's the thing though on social media there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people that advertise this right if you went to twitter and you looked at the dnd has hashtag on twitter you would think that every nobody plays a human elf or dwarf anymore they're all playing like half demons or furry characters or whatever you know or orcs or goblins or you know things that used to be evil monsters um and most of the times they're, they've got like the pride flag or whatever you know, and all this sort of stuff right they're doing the the whole woke virtue signaling thing um but statistically the most popular character um, to play in D&D, and they've, they've done this a couple of times in a row now, and both times it comes out the same, to their enormous frustration, is a male human cleric. That is the most popular sex, race, and class of, of all, right? Um, and in terms of like the popularity of the game, here's the thing. The um, fifth edition, as the rule book, was incredibly popular. The early adventures did very well. Um, but the last year's worth of products um, has seen a very, very steady decline that is accelerating. So that the last product, this Eat, Pray, Love book that I was telling you about, in bookstore sales, it did about 11,000 sales in the entire run. You know, like, and that is for, for, for Hasbro, that's pathetic. You know, 11,000 would be pretty good for an indie producer, right? But for for a multi-billion dollar multinational company that is a that is a disaster right it's the wreck of the titanic for them 
So there, there's some doubts about exactly how far this is going to go on because, I mean, I guess it depends on how much Hasbro wants to go the way of Disney or something. Yeah, I was just going to say that. So, I mean, we've seen the Disney sort of collapsing. The woke movies aren't aren't resonating with people. I mean, it really is. It doesn't seem to be working. Like go woke or go woke, go broke or whatever. It just seems to be a well, real Disney thing. Disney lost seven hundred and fifty million dollars this year. Yeah, from its movie, not it's, in general, but its movies had a loss of seven hundred fifty million. It seems like this is going to happen as well. I mean, it, it really does seem like uh, people are just not going to stick with this. There'll be a small sort of vocal group of supporters, but I don't think they realize. Uh, well, they, maybe they do. Maybe they don't care. They just need to put that put that narrative out there that the majority of people don't want this kind of thing. Well, there's another thing that's happened now, which is that the um, Hasbro and Wizards especially have both been taken over by a bunch of um, executives that have been brought in because Hasbro has been, by the way, has been losing money for five years. Its stock price is less than half of what it was five years ago, which is really bad for a, for a major company, right? So they hired in a bunch of executives from Microsoft, right? The current president of Hasbro is from Microsoft. The current president of Wizards of the Coast is from Microsoft. The current vice president in charge of Wizards of D and D is from Microsoft. And uh, these people, of course, you know, if you if you're a, you know, if, if you're a, a guy with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, uh, their answer to this is to go digital, and their plan for the next year is to create their own virtual tabletop. Um, you know, a meta style or second lifestyle thing where you can set up a, a completely virtual online game with people. They were even talking about having like um, AI dungeon masters, though I think that's that's still a bit <laughs> a bit out, no, out no, of reach at no, no, no. the moment. And to like digitize all of the product, digitize all of the game, and set it up as a subscription service. So you have to pay them every month to go to the virtual tabletop and play D and D. And then with microtransactions. So if you want your character to have, you know, a certain helmet or something in his avatar, you've got to pay, you know, 99 cents or whatever. And uh, they've done a lot of stuff that shows that this is really the direction they're going in already. Because, uh, for example, they they recently put out um, a set of, of, like, a rule supplement about... Um, what in the old days would have been called a stronghold, right? Which you'll remember that when you in, in D D when you got to a high enough level, you could build your own castle or something. Yeah, right? that's, that's what now, we, that was one of the main goals. I mean, one of the main goals, right? and now what they're doing is they're calling them bastions, and they're basically like houses, and you can get one like almost right away. And then you, when you level up, you can add sections to it. And you, and I'm thinking like that's so weird. Why are they doing this, right? Because for for twenty years nobody's paid attention to strongholds in the new editions. The reason is because of the BTT, right? Because it's like, okay, first you get your little house. Now, if you want to add a tower and you want to add a, you know, a tavern or you want to add a stable to it and get these de different benefits in the game, you're going to have to pay a, you know, buck 99 for each one of those, you know? But you it's all it a stronghold. monetization. But you can't Sorry? call it a stronghold. Why can't you call it a stronghold? Well, I don't know, but they chose the word back to I'm not sure how that's better or worse, but I'm sure that there's some stupid reason for it. Yeah, because strong, can, uh, you know, it's like strength and, uh, you know, you don't want it to be too aggressive. You know, the word can't be too aggressive. But the, the point is, too, though, is that this means that it's highly likely that in the next year, when they come out with the, with the new revised version of 5th edition, they, they'll probably still print the three main books. But this may be an excuse that they need to stop yeah. printing the other adventures because they know those adventures have become completely unprofitable. Yeah. But they can't just say, okay, screw it, you guys are all fired to all these diversity hires because oh. you know they'll get in trouble with DI and everything. You know, BlackRock will get mad at them and they own 15% of, of Hasbro, right? So um, so instead, if they say, well, you know, we're just shifting into a virtual tabletop, so sorry guys, and then then they have an excuse, right? They're not they're not saying we're we're kicking you out because you're useless and, and hemorrhaging money for us. They're saying we're changing our platform. And obviously a virtual tabletop means that dungeons are going to be like the default context for adventuring, right? So it'll probably end up looking a lot more like traditional D&D &D than the last three or four books that, that Wizards has produced looks like. Do you think um, they'll use the do you think they'll use this opportunity to to go sort of to back off on the wokeness a little bit then? I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. I have serious doubts given that, you know, like the current executive in charge of D&D &D is a guy named Kyle Brink, a white guy, right? 
who went uh, at the beginning of this year, he, he got into huge controversy because he went on a show, like a, a podcast on your YouTube, um, a, a vlog on YouTube. That was, that was, you know, one of these ones that are tailored to them, just like Disney has. It's like YouTubers that will be like total shills for Disney, yeah. you know, where he does YouTubers will be shills for them. And he went on there and he started bragging about how, um, you know, wizards is super dedicated to diversity. And then he like upped the ante by saying, well, you know what? Um, white male gamers can't leave this hobby soon enough. You know, like, so like he, he went out of his way to attack the central demographic of people who play tabletop RPGs, even though he himself is a white male gamer, right? And he's, he hasn't quit. So I don't know why he's 